right, so, so this is the last day. Friendly reminder, the whole real world experience in the world of database, um, when you're building a database, the first month of building the database, you're not building a database, you're interviewing people, you're asking questions. Um, did I tell you about Courtney? I didn't tell you about that? Okay, it ties into this. The last company I worked for, we uh, I was converting, um, it started off, I think I told you about the stack of cards that they had that were the leads, and then they came in and they had a person build a database that was not normalized, it was just one big fat table. And then I, along with uh, one of the other guys who actually works here at Salt Lake Community College, Jonathan Barnes, we built this new database and we were automating all the processes. So we had to find out which human at the company does this process. So we can talk to them and interview them and figure out how to put it in the database and how to make it all work. And so every time we asked that question, who does the manual process? The answer was always, Courtney does it. We talked to Courtney, she does it. And so I'm like, man, what? does anybody else around here work? Courtney does everything. So we decided to name our database Courtney. That's the name of our database. So all of our stored code, our stored procedures, and all of our functions and everything have the name in it, Courtney, in it somewhere. It'd be like, you know, Courtney underscore something, right? Uh, it became a running joke where um, we'd say, uh, we're going to build a process, and we'd say, oh, we're going to need to build another Courtney, right? Because that was the, all of our procedures. We didn't call them procedures. We called them Courtney's. So you got to have fun in the real world. Anyway, but it took us a long time interviewing Courtney a lot, like all day. Courtney, all right, let's go to lunch. We'll, we'll, we'll interview and figure out what you're doing here. Um, and crazy enough, once we automated everything, she still had a full-time job there. And in fact, the company did a lot of serious cutbacks, and they turned everybody into 1099 employees, including myself. Um, and the only two or three full-time employees left, she was one of them. I mean, she was just, you know, there's so much stuff that she was doing. Anyway... So in the real world, though, it's going to take you about a month, maybe, depending on how big the database is, to interview people, which is why we haven't written a single line of code for the last three or four lectures, or five or however many it is. Uh, next Monday, the next, the next lecture we have will be when we get into the code finally. So let's look at the last piece about formalizing all of the stuff about databases here. Uh, the first thing we're going to be looking at, um, we're going to look at what is the definition of an entity relationship diagram. Um, and then three different styles, and then we're going to do some, a bunch of group activities to practice, right? So here's the basic idea. Um, this is, what database is this? Yeah, it's a towel database, right? Those are the five tables. Now, the way the entity relationship diagram works, you have a block or a square that represents each table, okay, each entity, right, entity relationship diagram, and then how do they relate to each other? So you can see there's an arrow there pointing from rep to customer. What is that relationship? We know about these relationships. Now, what is that relationship? Yeah, it's a one to many, right? One rep can have many customers. So the arrow, that arrow is crooked. It's just a PowerPoint style thing. I don't know why it does that. But the, the arrow, it points to the many. The one comes from, the, the, the end of the arrow comes from the one, and it points to the many. This is the official formal way you're supposed to do this, right? Um, the other way is using these little crow's feet here, okay? Sorry about the crude little diagrams there. But this the crow's feet is the same idea, one to many. This makes more sense in my brain, right? Because it's, it's one and it forks out to many, right? But look at the relationship there. Just by looking at this, even if you didn't know anything about these tables, you know where there's a many-to-many -many situation. Where is that many-to-many -many situation? Yeah, it's the orders to item. Because there is one order can have many items and one item can be on many orders, because you have that many-to-many -many situation, we stick that bridge table in there, order underscore line, and you'll notice what's happening there, right? It's got the name order, which comes from here, and it's got the name line, which is the line item, right? That's, that's the, the uh, abbreviated word there, line item, which comes from this half. That's a very common syntax in the MySQL world is the, the name underscore the other name, okay? All right, so that's the basic. Then there's the OG style, the original gangsta, the old way we used to do this. Um, but I want to show you this because there's there still documentation out here like this. And this one's a little bit more um, verbose, but it helps the um, non-computer people, like your boss or whoever that may not be, you know, know this stuff. So the idea is you still have a block for every entity, 
then you have a little diamond in between them. And the diamond uses a word or a phrase that describes the relationship, okay? So knowing that we have this one to many, like one rep to one customer and so forth, you label them as such. That is a number one there. That looks like an L or something, but that's actually a one, okay? So what we're saying is there is a one to many. Now, why did we use an N instead of an M? Any thoughts? As many M seems like it would be. Anybody taking any math classes that are above, beyond maybe basic algebra two or something like that? Okay, and, and, you know, this is a very common thing you'll see in higher level math classes. When you're talking about, um, you'll hear the phrase like the nth term or something like that. It means you, it, it's, it's a way to shorthand saying one to infinity, basically. You know, you say uh, one, two, three, four, all the way up to N, right? All the way up to some number N. All right, that's the basic idea. So it's just a math way of representing that. And you'll see if you do take, we were talking about the discrete math class, 2430. If you do take that class, we actually get into set theory and the, like what's going on behind the scenes in databases. And you see a lot of this, um, this, this stuff here, like the deep theory behind it. Anyway, so what would be a word we could put in this first diamond right here that would represent the relationship between reps and customers? Or a phrase or something. One rep does what to many customers? Have. One rep can have many customers, yeah. That's one phrase. What else? Serves. Serves. Yep. All of the above. Anything. I mean, there's no rule here, right? Just as long as it makes grammatical sense. I think in this case, we use the word represents, yeah. Represents, okay. What about customer to order? Orders. So remember, the way you read it is one customer, some things, many orders, right? What is that something that they do? Has. What else? Placed. placed places, placed, right? Something like that. Again, there's no rule, but believe it or not, this kind of stuff is some of the dumbest stuff that you run into in the real world where you're like, oh, I can't think of a variable name. What do I do, right? I can't think of a, a, how to, what word to use, right? And so I want you guys to think about it so you're not stuck in that situation, right? So customer, one customer placed many orders. All right, how about the relationship between orders and order line? One order, something, many order lines. Contains, has, yeah, lots of different things. Contains is a good one. You read the book, didn't you? You're using all the right. You're using all the words that are there. It's funny. Either that or you're like the luckiest guesser in the world. All right. You want to buy me a lottery ticket? So uh, then the last one. Now notice the relationship here. The many is on the left, right? We have we have this and then this, but we don't read it that way. Okay. We read it the other way still. We read it from the one to the many. Okay. So what would be a good there? One item, something, many order line is on. One item is on many order lines, right? So again, this is not uh, a class in like how to invent words, right? It's just, I just want you to be thinking about that because if you have to do one of these diagrams, then you'll have to, you know, think through the process here, okay? All right, so any questions about these three styles? Right, we had the one with the arrow, which points to the many. We have the one with the crow's feet, points to the many. And then we have this one where you label it with a one and an N, and you have those little diamonds in the middle, okay? So we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to practice this on the screen. This is where all the people watching the video can pause and try it out themselves. Um, but you have the PDF um, that has all the tables and all the databases in it from the Module 1 stuff. I think it's the very first lecture in Module 1. You have the PDF. You're going to, in your teams, which are going to be really small, create the entity relationship diagrams on the board. All right, we're back, and we've all tried it out on the whiteboard, and I think we all got there. So let's just take a quick look here. Style, this is style number two here, which is um, there's a one-to-many relationship from guides to trip guides. So look at your answers on the board. 
or if you're just watching the video, look at your answers on paper because I know you paused the video and you tried this yourself. I know you did. I have faith. So uh, take, look at, we have one guide can have many trip guides, right? The whole point of that trip guides table is it is that bridge table because one guide, uh, I'm sorry, many guides can have many trips, right? One guide can have multiple trips and one trip can be um, uh, different guides, right? Make sense? Okay. And then the reservation, one trip can have many reservations. Uh, the example I've used a few times with some of you walking around the room is, you know, um, the trip to Colorado can have 10 different people can reserve it. That's no problem. And then one customer can reserve many, make many reservations. Again, one customer can reserve the Florida trip, the Colorado trip, the Georgia trip, the Spain trip, whatever, right? So I think we're okay there. Um, again, one guy can have many trip guides and one trip can have many trip guides, okay? And then I think I have style one. I do not have style one, okay. So here's the OG style, which, and again, it's technically not called OG. That's just me being silly to help you remember. It's the way they used to do it back in the day. Um, and you still will see this out in the real world. So what's a good word for one guide blank trip guides? One too many there. Has, yeah. I think that's the default word I use on every slide here. Has. One guide has multiple trip guides, right? One trip has multiple trip guides. One trip has many reservations and one customer makes many reservations, right? Whatever word you want to use is fine, okay? Pretty straightforward. Feeling okay about that? Okay. All right, you get to do it again with the Solmaris database. Same thing. Um, we're going to make pick style one or style two. If you chose style one the first round, do style two this time and vice versa. And then, um, of course, you're going to make the OG version as well. All right? So pause the video here and give it a shot. All right, hopefully you took a minute to try these out if you're watching this video at home and you got your pad and paper and you're going to match everything we're about to see on the screen here. And the service category, service request, condo unit, owner, and location. These are the five tables. And one service category can be requested multiple times, right? One category has many requests. When, what's, the, what's some of the categories? Can you guys remember from seeing the data? What's a category? What could a category be if you don't remember the data? Electrical. Yeah, electrical, like I, I, a wiring problem, right? Or plumbing problem or whatever, right? So can the category plumbing be requested multiple times, right? Condo unit five requested, condo unit seven requested, and so on and so forth, okay? Which you can see the next thing, the relationship from condo unit to service request. Can condo unit make more than one request. Can I call up and say, hey, my AC's busted today and call tomorrow and say, hey, I got a flood in my, my toilet overflowed or whatever, right? Yeah, the two different requests, okay? Location, what's location? Yeah, it's the location of the, like it's, you know, the Murray location or the Sandy location or the whatever location, right? Obviously, they're gonna have multiple units, it makes sense. You don't just have one unit on your property and that's it, right? You have multiple ones, okay? And then owner, can an owner have more than one condo? Sure, no rule says you can't buy more than one. Now, that rule could exist in the real world. That's something that's important to think about. The company might say, no, you're only allowed to buy one of our condos. It'd be silly, but they could do that. Okay. So let's look at the other version of it. And again, now notice how I got these arrows all drawn, bent, and not arrows, but the lines. There's no rules about where to position things. Just make it look nice, you know? Um, so again, we have the same relationships, and what, what words did we come up with for the diamonds? Yes, that's pretty much it, right? Service category has many requests, right? Condo unit makes many service requests. Uh, the condo, or the location has many condo units and the owner owns, but has works too, right? No big deal, okay? All right, so um, the plan was to make sure we understand what an entity relationship diagram is, three different styles, and again, OG is just me making up funny words that don't, that's not really what it's called. It's just the old way they used to do it. And then we did a few group activities. Okay, how do we feel about the basic idea of an entity relationship diagram? What is the purpose of an entity relationship diagram? It's like a visual of it, where you put it into it. Yeah, it's a visual representation of it. One of the things, and this listen carefully to this, it, it, this applies to people that are coders, people that are database programmers. Um, anytime the stuff that your, your field is, you're designing stuff, you're building stuff, you're creating things from scratch. And you have to remember that you're not the only one that's going to use it, right? It's all in your head. You know, 
right? Software that I've written for myself, I don't document it. I don't care because I know what it does and I know how it works. But you got to remember, you're not going to be with the company forever. They're going to replace you with the, the new guy right out of college who makes less money than, than you, right? That happens in the real world. Um, or they're, they just, they, maybe they just contracted you to do just, just this one job. So you've got to document the heck out of it so that the next IT person that comes in can look and see what's going on. How do you document it? Use the formal notation we've talked about before with the, the parentheses and the underlining of the words, and then you use these kind of things, right? We'll learn later in the semester what's called an entity, or sorry, it's called a, an enhanced entity relationship diagram, E-E-R, instead of just E-R, okay? And we'll learn about that when we get into um, Workbench, okay? Any questions?